it's time for our guest speakers. Our first guest speaker of the night is Dr. Dennis Todd. Again, he's going to be sharing info on us with us on genetics, hybrids, and true breeding lines. Uh, thanks, Bethany, for the opportunity to be here and to talk about stuff that I find really fascinating. I'm not a geneticist, uh, unlike Mowgli, who I'm sure will give you much more information that's current. Uh, but I do know how to read the literature, and I spent the last couple of days uh, really combing over what's the latest and uh, most informative stuff in the scientific literature. So uh, tonight I'm going to give you a talk that I, I was inspired to, to do research when I ordered uh, some seeds from Amsterdam of uh, supposedly high CBD strains, and I spent 150 bucks. They were smuggled in in the brim of a hat uh, through the mails. Uh, with great excitement, I planted them all. And out of the 15 seeds that I got, not one had high CBD. So uh, this is bogus. Either the, the uh, well-respected uh, seed dispensary is a scam, or there's more going on. Well, this is what's going on. So uh, tonight, I'm going to do some review of basic genetics. Uh, hope this isn't too boring for those of you who know the stuff already. I hope it's informative for those of you who don't. So the first message here is that genes are stretches of DNA that code for proteins. And you saw this in the trivia uh, earlier. The second is that genes occur in alternate forms, and those are called alleles. So at one place on the chromosome, so-called locus, there could be one of any number of different forms of a gene. The third point is that cloning preserves genotypes. So if you have a plant that is a particularly fine plant, be sure to take cuttings. The fourth point is that sexual reproduction, that is seed production, shuffles genotypes. And that's the bane of people who buy seeds. Because your chances of getting what you want are pretty slim, as I will show you. And then five, most cannabis strains are not true breeding. Well, in the cell, in a plant cell, there are actually three different places where you can find DNA. In the nucleus, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight, is the nuclear DNA, but also in the energy converting organelles. The mitochondria, uh, this is not a scale at all. The mitochondria are much smaller, and there are very many of them in a cell. The mitochondria convert carbohydrate energy into ATP energy. That's what powers most of the activities in the cell. The other organelle is the chloroplast, and that's where sunlight is captured and converted into uh, uh, carbohydrate energy. Uh, interestingly enough, both the mitochondria and the chloroplast are thought to be endosymbiotic bacteria they were trapped many, many years ago in the cell and have become symbionts uh, essential to the function of the cell and performing functions that nuclear genes cannot specify. So uh, cannabis has 20 chromosomes, 10 pairs of chromosomes. One of each pair came from mom and one of each pair came from dad. Now here's uh, the genotype, or here are the condensed chromosomes of a female plant, here are the condensed chromosomes of a male plant, and you'll see that the difference is, like humans, female plants, oops, let's go back here, um, female plants are XX, male plants are XY, that is, they have dissimilar chromosomes. So the two chromosomes of a pair include the same genes in the same sequence except for chromosomal rearrangement mutations. So in this diagram, there's gene A, gene B, gene C, gene D. And you'll see that there are alternate forms. Uh, capital A shows a dominant gene, and little a shows a recessive gene. We'll talk about that in a minute. So as I say, uh, two chromosomes, one from each parent, determine the sex of a cannabis plant. XX equals female, XY equals male. But there's a lot more to the story. Apparently, every cannabis plant has the ability to manifest female flowers and male flowers. And you saw in the trivia questions earlier how you can dose a female plant with certain chemicals and have it produce male flowers that are uh, 
fully functional and produce uh, lives uh, pollen. And that's how feminized plants, uh, feminized seeds are made, is you convert some part of a female plant into male. Well, that female is going to have only XX chromosomes, so all the seeds have XX chromosomes. There's no Y involved at all. So uh, they may become hermaphroditic, but they won't be males. So the basics of uh, uh, genes and proteins is that a gene is a stretch of DNA that specifies the amino acid sequence of a particular protein. So here's the DNA. Enzymes unwind the DNA. Other enzymes move in and make a copy called uh, messenger RNA. And I liken this to the sort of an architect's blueprints or an architect's master plan for a building is kept in the safe in the architect's office. That's the DNA in the nucleus. That's the safe. The architect produces cheap throwaway copies called blueprints of specific parts. So the electricians would get one blueprint, the framers would get another blueprint. That's the messenger RNA. And then the workers out in the field or at the job site read that blueprint and make their final product uh, on that basis. So mutations are changes in the sequence of the DNA units, the bases. And mutations come in many, many different kinds. The simplest kind is a single nucleotide change. So here, single nucleotide polymorphism, one base is different. And that's very common. Uh, they, single nucleotide changes may have variable effects from no discernible effect, no changes in the amino acid sequence, to changes in the amino acid sequence that, re, that change the effect of the resulting protein. Uh, chromosomal rearrangements. Um, so mutations may change the amino acid sequence in proteins or prevent the formation of functional proteins. And we'll see how that's important when we talk about high THC, low CBD strains. Chromosome rearrangements may duplicate or delete genes. So whole sections of the DNA might be switched around, might be inverted, might be swapped onto a different chromosome, and not always do all the parts of the gene go with it. So if you end up with a, um, uh, a truncated gene, <clears throat> it might not be able to specify a functional protein. You may also end up duplicating genes, and this can then double the production of the messenger RNA, double production of protein, or it may allow a, the, one of the copies to mutate into a new form. Uh, it has different functions. Well, uh, biosynthesis pathways are very complex and uh, have multiple uh, uh, enzymes along the way. So each step in a, in a metabolic pathway is catalyzed typically by one, en one or more enzymes. And choke points can occur anywhere along the pathway. So if you have 20 or 30 different steps that you need to go through before you produce THCA, uh, a defect in any enzyme anywhere along the way can slow it down, or a more efficient enzyme can speed it up. And enzymes may compete for the same substrate molecules. And this is especially important in the CBD THC system, where they both uh, operate on the same basic chemical. So uh, I'm going to be alternating uh, without any logic to it, uh, between THC and THCA for my definitions. But keep in mind that the, the plant is producing THCA, and as was pointed out earlier, uh, the THCA is converted to THC by the process of decarboxylation, which uh, involves heat and getting rid of the carboxyl. So this is sort of the last few steps of the synthetic pathway. As you can imagine, there's a lot of steps to get to that, from sugars to that first one. And down, and 
Uh, one of the tricks is that enzyme names typically end in ASE. So the precursor here for me, uh, for several uh, cannabinoids, is uh, CBGA. CBGA is converted by THC synthase into delta 9 THCA. It's also converted by CBDA synthase into CBDA. And the relative efficiency of those two enzymes determines the ratio of THC to CBD in the final product. So in, alleles may code for enzymes with varying efficiency. And uh, the breeding of high THC strains has increased the efficiency of enzymes throughout the THCA synthesis pathway. So if you compare, let's say, the, the uh, uh, conversion rate, the production rate in a high THC uh, plant compared to um, uh, a hemp plant, which has very, very low THC, you see that all the way along, thanks to thousands of years of breeding, the THC-rich plants have highly efficient enzymes compared to the CBR to the hemp plants, which often have crippled enzymes or very inefficient enzymes, and that accounts for the low THCA production. In fact, high THC strains have almost exclusively CBDA synthase uh, enzymes that are non-functional. That is, they've been mutated to the point where the pr protein they produce, if they produce protein at all, is incapable of converting CBG to CBGA to, T to CBDA. And hemp strains are selected for low THCA synthase activity. When I mean, that's because of the law, primarily. Um, the law where hemp production is allowed usually specifies that the THC in the THCA in the final product has to be below a uh, fraction of a percent. So, uh, coming to the point of a dominant gene versus a recessive gene, a dominant allele shows in the phenotype even when present on only one of the pair of chromosomes. That is, that pair of chromosomes is heterozygous. There are two different kinds or that, that pair of alleles, rather, on two homologous chromosomes is uh, different. The two forms are different. And uh, a recessive allele shows only when present on both chromosomes. That is, it's homozygous. Sexual reproduction shuffles parts of the paired chromosomes and creates uh, pollen and eggs, so-called gametes, with only one copy of each chromosome. So here we have a, a sort of a model cell with two chromosomes. The big ones are the homologous pair, the small ones are the homologous pair. Let's say this pair is from dad and the red pair is from mom. Well, when they go through the process of meiosis to create gametes, those homologous chromosomes swap parts, and this shows then that the resulting chromosomes that end up have parts of mom and parts of dad. Keep in mind that in nature, many, many crossing overs would occur, not just one on a chromosome. And the number of chromosomes in a cell is reduced from, in this case, four to two. And instead of pairs of homologous chromosomes, there's only one chromosome of each pair. And then, in uh, fertilization, two of these would combine to form a new cell with a doubled uh, chromosome number. So true breeding plants, which are the standard of the industry for uh, commercial agriculture, so if you buy a packet of seeds from territorial seed, you get true breeding plants. Uh, those are selected very strongly for homogeneity. And most of the genes are homozygous. If the genes were heterozygous, 
you get a lot of variability in the seed production, in the, in the seedlings that uh, germinate. So uh, commercial seed developers in normal agriculture are ruthless in weeding out the sports, the oddballs, the outliers. And just for the sake of example, I'm picking up uh, this genotype. So here's the genotype that's true breeding. You see A is homozygous, B is homozygous recessive, C is homozygous dominant, D is homozygous dominant, E is homozygous recessive. And when they produce gametes, pollen or eggs, all have the same genotype. And when they are fertilized, still fertilized, you get the same genotype as the parent. And various techniques are used to uh, uh, reduce the heterogeneity. Uh, a lot of different techniques over the years. Um, one of the things that can be done with pot is to uh, do a sex conversion. So a dose of branch of a female plant with the right hormone or chemical, make pollen, and you self-fertilize that. And you do that six or eight times, and you keep selecting for the same genotype for consistency, and you can reduce the um, heterogeneity in the plant quite a bit. So crossing two dissimilar strains produces hybrid offspring. And if you get hybrid corn, for example, for your garden, uh, that's produced by having a row of uh, type A corn and a row of type B corn. You take all the tassels off the type A corn so it can't produce any pollen. And you harvest the seeds from the type A, which are pollinated by the type B. So all the offspring are uh, offspring of both parents. That is their hybrids. And uh, that's the case here. So a hybrid genotype with all the genes heterozygous, all the aliens heterozygous, comes from parents that were homozygous but different at all those gene loci. Hybrids have a lot of value. They may be uh, more vigorous, uh, more productive, uh, have any number of fine traits that neither parent strain has. But when you try to produce eggs and sperm from hybrids, you end up with a mess, just a mess. So let's say we have two parent plants that are different in only three genes. And they you cross those with itself. You end up with, or first of all, when they produce gametes, you end up with eight different possibilities for genotype in gametes. And when you cross that with itself, you end up with 64 different genotypes in the offspring. So if you're trying to create a true breeding line of plants, you don't want to start with hybrids. And most cannabis strains are hybrids. Most cannabis strains have been developed by people who did not study agronomy in college. <laughs> Very few strains are true breeding. Even the commercial hemp varieties, for example, which may be selected pretty strongly for one tree or another, still have a fairly high level of heterozygosity. So, uh, if you have a heterozygosity rate of about one quarter of one percent, which is pretty typical for marijuana or hemp, uh, that would imply that out of the 30,000 genes in the genome, 75 are uh, mutant or are different. 75 are heterozygous. And so seeds produced by crossing 200 strains have highly variable genotypes that rarely match either parent. And a plant with desirable genotypes should be propagated by cloning. Another factor involved is that combining traits from different strains can be very challenging. So if you're trying to create a high CBD strain, let's say, but a balanced THC-CBD 
uh, with uh, high limonene and high caryophylline and a few other things. Uh, good luck. One example I picked out of uh, one of the uh, online sources on O'Shaughnessy's was a test of um, canatonic crossed with sour tsunami. Uh, Lawrence Ringo, a famous breeder, uh, developing high CBD strains, uh, produced, crossed these to produce canna soup. I'm sure some of you have seen that. The Pure Analytics Lab tested canna soup seedlings for the CBD THC ratios. Well, we're starting off with hybrids as parents. Canna tonic and hybrid cross. Roughly half the seedlings are CBD rich. Sour tsunami is a hybrid cross. Roughly one quarter of the seedlings are CBD rich. Here's the family, a, a truncated family tree of sour tsunami. And you can see all kinds of genotypes being contributed here to sour tsunami. So it's a model of a mess. Tsunami. That's a tsunami. Tsunami. Uh, well, when they germinated these seeds and they tested them, they found that five of the eight seedlings were CBD dominant. Of the five, one was found to have a cannabinoid profile that was almost entirely CBD, with only a small amount of THC. And the remaining four of the CBD dominant seedlings had a two to one THC to THC ratio. And um, because the CBDA synthase and THCA synthase both compete for the same substrate, this indicates that the CBD producing enzyme is more efficient at capturing and converting the CBG than is the THC. And that's why you'll often see a two to one ratio uh, like that in uh, CBD THC plants. So, the bottom line. Most cannabis strains are hybrids bred from hybrid parents. They include lots of genetic variability. Uh, a couple of papers that I read found that uh, most of the drug strains, as the THC strains that were tested, were heterozygous for the active form of THCA synthase, which means they have one good copy of the THCA synthase gene and one bad copy. So half their gametes will have the good copy, and half will have the bad copy. Half the seeds, good, half the seeds, bad. The uh, final point here is that cannabis seedlings rarely match either parent, and only a few will have the desired genotypes. So clone, clone, clone. Uh, questions or comments? How the epigenetics affects the expression of the traits in the process that you talk about. Yeah, uh, epigenetics, uh, that these days uh, refers largely to the methylation of set stretches of the DNA. That is uh, a little uh, single carbon chemical attached to the DNA in locations can control the expression of the genes, that is, whether the genes are, are uh, uh, transcribed into messenger RNA. And they may enhance or suppress the uh, expression of those genes. Unlike the DNA, which is strictly inherited from parents, the uh, epigenetic factors are in part the result of life experiences. So if you put two strains that are, or two plants that are clonal, that have exactly the same DNA, into two different environments, you may end up with uh, quite different gene expressions because of that methylation difference. And uh, in humans, at least, I, I, don't, I didn't find anything on this in, in cannabis, but in humans, that epigenetic factor may be inherited. So Lamarck was partly right. Any other questions?
is there a limit to how many times a plane can be cloned? You know, there's some mythology suggesting that after a few years it loses its vigor, particularly in terms of uh, robustness of growing, not necessarily the potency of the plant. I didn't find anything about that in the literature. All I can say is from personal experience, I've been maintaining one strain for 15 years through cloning. So it can be done. So a follow-up question to that. Um, a lot of CBD strains um, have been no noticing the, uh, um, that they've been losing a potency. Uh, is that maybe the because like the the CBD synthase is uh, not as active or um, through cloning? Like we've been seeing that. Like I've seen that personally in the strain that I've cloned uh, year after year and uh, tested through OG Analytical and then came up with different result, uh, different numbers. Um, is that potentially, would you, what I'm arguing is, is that, uh, that maybe the CBD synthase is not, isn't as uh, activated or maybe hindered through the, the cloning process. Uh, so, do I understand your question properly? That over the, over the years as you propagated the same strain through cloning, you've seen changes in the CBD content? Yeah. Uh, well. There also are somatic mutations that occur. So the ordinary process of mitosis is remarkably faithful at uh, reproducing the same genotype over and over and again. However, there can be mutations in that process. And so uh, if you take a branch, uh, cutting from a branch in a plant that's had a somatic mutation like that, it might not show up in the vegetative factors at all. But the plant, the clone that you produce, may have uh, uh, an altered gene, a mutated gene, that um, doesn't have the fidelity that your, your parent plant had. That's the only, th the only way I can figure that out to happen. Hey, um, what's your favorite cloning gel, uh, steroid, or root stimulant? Question in the back. Dennis? Where's the question? <laughs> right here. All right, wait a minute. Hey, um, I was wondering what your favorite uh, cloning gel, cloning steroid, or root stimulant was, because you said you kept a single plant consistent for 15 years. So I was wondering what your favorite. Oh, I've been using Dip and Grow. There are a lot of different products, products that work well. I have a question. Um, are you basically saying that most of the uh, commercial available seeds on the market are not accurate representations of what the breeder intended them to be and basically a crapshoot? I'm sorry, say it again. Uh, that the seeds, most of the commercially available uh, cannabis seeds on the market are not uh, necessarily what the breeder intended them and basically a crapshoot? It's a crapshoot. If you spend 50 bucks and you get five seeds, your chance that one of them is what you want pretty low. You know, if you got 20 seeds or 50 seeds for that 50 bucks, it'd be a lot better deal. Right. Right, so he, he, he points out that you need to back breed to get rid of the heterozygosity. And once you do that, you can establish a true breeding strain. But most people don't do that. And you look at any of the uh, 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 family trees of any of the strains in Leafly or anything like that, it's just a mix mishmash of varieties that have been bred, bred together. So I have a question. Um, so going back to having your strain for 15 years, did you keep the same mom for that, or did you regenerate a different mom every year? I switch I switch moms out every three or four months. Every three or four months. Yeah, and they start to lose vigor after that. Thank you. And I always choose the most vigorous clones, most vigorous cuttings uh, for parents. 
which means uh, capturing some somatic mutations, um, but uh, the vigor is not gone. Let's do one more question for Dennis before we move on to our next speaker. We have one more. Can you explain the uh, breeding process that would make the true breed uh, clone? How to make a true breeding line? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm not an agronomist, but one example is this uh, selfing where you have a desire, a female plant that you like, you treat one of the branches with a chemical or a hormone to create pollen, you fertilize the uh, flowers on that plant, you germinate those seeds, you call out the ones that don't look good, you keep the one, the one that looks the best that you really want to emulate, you breed that with itself in the same way. Do that six, seven, eight times, you're gonna end up with a fairly true reading line. Thank you, Bethany. That was richly informative. Thank you again so much for taking the time to put that together and share it with us tonight, Dennis.